So we just completed talking about pulse-coded modulation. Pulse-coded modulation is a type of digital signaling. Remember, we actually had two definitions for what we mean by a digital signal. One definition of a digital signal is a signal that is discrete in time and discrete in amplitude. So that's one definition of a digital signal. The other definition of a digital signal, the one we're doing here, is one that is used as a continuous time signal that is used to represent bits of information, and this continuous time signal takes on a finite number of levels. So that's the uh, definition of digital signal that we're using here. And here's an example of a digital signal. This is a continuous time signal. It exists for all times t, but you'll note that it only takes on discrete levels. It can either be this value or it can be this value, and those are the only two values this message can take on. When there's only two values, you actually call that a binary signal because there's only two options. So let's talk just a little bit more generally about why we like digital messages. And we're going to do it kind of with a, a cartoon here, but it'll get the point across. So here is my digital message or my digital signal that I could be using to convey bits of information. Maybe I've decided that negative amplitudes correspond to a binary zero and positive amplitudes correspond to a binary one. So as you see, negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, positive one, positive one, etc. At a receiver somewhere, you know how to decode that to bits. And bits of information are what we're trying to convey almost always in a communication system. Well, wouldn't it be nice if the transmitted message that I sent looked exactly like this when I received it? Well, that really never happens. Due to communication over our channel medium, what we actually receive more often than not is going to look something like this. Almost always the physical medium that we're transmitting over, which is called the channel, and that channel can be, you know, just air if you're doing wireless communication, could be copper wires, could be fiber optics. There are lots of different channel types, but almost always that channel is going to introduce distortions to our signal. So here in just kind of a cartoon is what I might receive if this was my original message. So you can see what's happened. I don't have crisp corners anymore. Noise has been added on. It's been distorted quite a bit. So why, why do I like digital messages? Well, let's look at that on the next chart. So let's say this was the received digital message that I obtained. I know that some of these values aren't allowed. What I transmitted could only have values negative one or one. So when I receive a message like this, because what was transmitted I know had to be restricted to either minus ones or ones, I'm able to look at this message and reconstruct it. In here, I say to myself, wow, that's pretty close to negative one, so I think that should have been negative one. And up here where it was positive, even though it takes on many different values, I threshold all those to one. And then in here, because those are mainly negative, I threshold those to minus one. So by examining this message, I can make guesses as to what I think the original digital message was. That's only possible for digital messages because we've restricted them to a finite number of allowable values. If I didn't restrict them to a list of allowable values, I would not be able to go from here to here because maybe this itself was allowed. If I have an infinite number of allowable levels, there's nothing that says that this noisy signal isn't the right signal. I can't guess that it should have been one. So this is why we like digital messages. In the presence of noise and distortion, we can take signals that look like this and we can perfectly demodulate or reconstruct the original digital signal even with these noise and interference and distortions present. So that's a pretty huge advantage. We now have signals that we can transmit that we know our channel is going to distort and introduce noise to. And if the noise is within certain limits, if it hasn't messed it up too badly, we can still figure out what that original dis digital message was, which corresponds to figuring out what the original bits were, and decode the original bits perfectly. So that's pretty huge. How do we make sure that the noise with it is within certain limits? Well, one thing that you can do, and that often happens when we're transmitting, say perhaps down copper wire, the further that we transmit down the wire, the more distortion and noise is introduced. Well, what I can do is I can introduce something called a repeater. I can put this device into my network after a certain amount of feet before the noise has gotten too bad, you know, put it at a point where the noise has only distorted it some, I can look at the incoming noisy message, 
reconstruct it, and then retransmit it. That's what the job of a repeater, its job is to look at the message, reconstruct it, and then retransmit this clean copy of the message down the medium again. So with repeaters, we can kind of indefinitely transmit this digital message perfectly down a medium, just making sure that we have a repeater placed at a point before the degradation has gotten too bad. If we do that right, we can basically transmit down our medium indefinitely without losing any bits of information. Another reason we like digital signals is this, in general, digital hardware is much more flexible. Once you go to digital signaling and doing things in software, essentially, we uh, have a lot more flexibility. For instance, we can now do coding techniques. So there's a whole branch of math and engineering called error control coding. The job of that field is to code messages in a way that actually let you fix errors. So I've got this noisy signal. I make my best guess as to what I think the original digital message was, guessing ones and minus ones. Well, the coding techniques allow us to identify errors in that process. So even though I've decided here's what I think the original bitstream was, error control coding lets us examine that and fix errors that are present. It's a very inter interesting field to say the least. Another thing that we can do once we are using digital signals using finite alphabets of things, is we can go and use encryption. So there's a whole branch of math and engineering related to encryption and cryptography that we can use on our signals if we are doing digital signals. So that concludes this section of charts on sampling, really this whole sequence of videos. What we've learned is that when we have a band-limited signal, we can perfectly reconstruct the continuous time signal from just its samples. That is very nice because that what that means is we can deal with just a list of numbers instead of an infinite number of values in the continuous time signals. In practice, there are a variety of practical problems for this. If I have a band-limited signal, that means that's a signal that exists in the time domain for forever. So in the real world, in practice, I never get to deal with band-limited signals because I always observe signals for a finite amount of time. So we talked about the time-limited nature of things using anti-aliasing filters and things like that. We also talked about the fact that when I sample, I don't have an ideal impulse train available. I might have to do more of a sample and hold type signaling sampling strategy. But we talked through that and things work out still very, very well. Our kind of key result from this section of slides and videos is Nyquist sampling theorem. It tells us how to sample correctly. If I'm band limited to a bandwidth of W, I need to sample at 2W or greater. Really what we've done by sampling is we've gone, like I said, from this continuous time signal to a list of numbers. And that list of numbers is much more easy to deal with and store on a computer. Actually, it's the only way to get things on a computer is go to this list of numbers that's finite in length. Once we are to a list of numbers on a computer, we have lots of options and a lot of flexibility available. We can turn this sampled in time and quantized in amplitude digital signal into pulses. We can do pulse modulation. We can do pulse coded modulation. So we have ways of representing these sampled and quantized signals in the digital world. And we have ways of transmitting information in a way via pulse modulation or pulse coded modulation or any other digital signaling strategies in a way that can be recovered very well at a receiver even in the presence of noise. So doing advanced signal processing has a lot of advantages in terms of recovering noisy signals. It also has advantages in terms of doing error control coding and cryptography. We didn't get into that. Those are whole graduate level courses you can take, but they are good to start being aware of for the future. So lots of great topics we've covered here. Some things we did not discuss, and these are some important things to mention. First of all, we did not mention sampling of band pass signals. All the signals that we talked about were low pass signals. They were starting at DC, went up to some high frequency. You can still apl apply our sampling theorem to a band pass signal. So a band pass signal is one that is centered at some carrier frequency. So picture being centered at FC, and going from FC minus W to FC plus W. That's where your frequency content is centered. If we apply the Nyquist theorem to that signal, we would still want to sample at two times the maximum frequency, which would be FC plus W. So that theory still works. It's just that you can do a much better job 
if you rework it for bandpass signals. Sampling at Nyquist on a bandpass signal will work, but you're going to have to sample at a tremendous sampling rate. If you know that you have a bandpass signal, there are more clever things that you can do, um, and we just did not talk about that here. That'll be a topic for another set of charts and videos. Another thing that we did not talk about that is covered in your textbook in this chapter is the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform. This really ties into what we talked about in the sampling spectral theory just a little bit. We talked about sampling the spectrum of a signal. So once we get to the chapter that deals with frequency domain analysis, we will revisit the discrete Fourier transform. But that's it for now.